Welcome back to my channel. This is Wiredog Sec back with another video for you guys. In today's video, we are continuing on with Try Hack Me. This is the Junior Penetration Tester Learning Path Network Security Module, and this is the Protocols and Servers Room. Learn about common protocols such as HTTP, FTP, POP3, SMTP, and IMAP, along with related insecurities. Let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, let's get started. Task one, introduction. This room introduces the user to a few protocols commonly used such as HTTP, FTP, POP3, SMTP, and IMAP. Each task about each protocol will be designed to help us understand what happens on the low level and is usually hidden by an elegant GUI, which is graphical user interface. We will talk using the above protocols using a simple Telnet client to fully understand what your GUI client is doing under the hood. Our purpose is not to memorize the protocol commands, but rather to get a closer look at the protocol while it is working. We also discuss some of the insecurities. In particular, we focus on password sent in clear text. And to the question below, I've already started up the attack box, as you can see there, and the virtual machine that we're going to be using. Task number two, Telnet. The Telnet protocol is an application layer protocol used to connect to a virtual terminal of another computer. Using Telnet, a user can log into another computer and access its terminal console to run programs, start batch processes, and perform system administration tasks remotely. Telnet protocol is relatively simple. When a user connects, they will be asked for a username and password. Upon complete or correct authentication, the user will access the remote system's terminal. Unfortunately, all the communication between the Telnet client and the Telnet server is not encrypted, making it an easy target for attackers. A Telnet server uses the Telnet protocol to listen for incoming connections on port 23. Please note that Telnet port is not open on the target VM. Let's consider the example shown below. A user is connecting to the Telnet D, a Telnet server. The steps are as follows here. First step. First, he is asked to provide his login name, username. We can see the user entering Frank. Number two, then he is asked for the password, which is that password there. The password is not shown on the screen. However, we display it below for demonstration purposes. Number three, once the system checks his login credentials. He is greeted with a welcome message for, and the remote server grants him a command prompt, which is the following here. The dollar sign indicates that this is not a root terminal. And here's a screenshot of what they're talking about here. We can see here Telnet and is connecting to this particular uh, server here and login is Frank. There's the password and here's the uh, banner information whenever you log in, right? So let's go ahead and continue on. Although Telnet gave us access to the remote system terminal in no time, it is not a reliable protocol for remote administration as all the data are sent in clear text. In the figure below, we captured the traffic generated by Telnet and it was easy uh, to find the password. The figure below shows the ASCII data uh, exchange between our computer and the remote system. The text in red is the text that we are sending to the remote system, while the text in blue is the text that the remote system is sending. Note how the username was sent back, echoed as or echoed at us to display them in our terminal. However, the password was not. In other words, if someone is watching us type, they won't be able to see the password characters on the screen. And here's what that looks like here. Okay. Telnet is no longer considered a secure option, especially that anyone capturing your network traffic will be able to discover your usernames and passwords, which would grant them access to the remote system. The secure alternative is SSH, which is Secure Shell, which we present in the next room. Answer questions below. To which port will the Telnet command with the default parameters try to connect to? That's going to be port 23, as discussed earlier. All right, task number three, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP. Let's get into it. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP, is the protocol used to transfer web pages. Your web browser connects to the web server and uses HTTP to request HTML pages and images, among other files, and submit forms and upload various files. Anytime you browse the World Wide Web, which is www, you are certainly using HTTP protocol. 
the image below shows a client requesting HTML page index.html, which the web server provides. Then the client requests an image logo.jpg, and the web server sends it. And here's what that traffic looks like here. HTTP sends and receives data as clear text, not encrypted. Therefore, you can use a simple tool such as Telnet or Netcat to communicate with a web server and act as a web browser. The key difference is that you need to input the HTTP related commands instead of the web browser doing that for you. In the following example, we will see how we can request a page from a web server. Moreover, we will discover the web server version. To accomplish this, we will use the Telnet client. We chose it because Telnet is a simple tool. Furthermore, it uses clear text for communication. We will use Telnet instead of a web browser to request a file from the web server. The steps will be as follows. First, we will connect to port 80 using this following information here. So I'm going to copy and paste this over here. So create a new tab. And here we go. Next, we need to type the following here, which is this, this get and then the following information after that. So I'm going to copy and paste like that to receive the index.html or get HTTP 1.1 to retrieve the default page. Finally, you need to provide some value uh, for the host like the following here. So let's go ahead and type, put this in there and hit the enter return key twice. So there we go. Now we can see what that looks like here. And the console outputs below, we could recover the requested page along with a trove of information, not usually displayed to the web browser. If the page we request is not found, we get error 404. All right, so let's go ahead and continue here. Of particular interest in the output above is that the user needs only to type a couple of commands to get the page they need, which is the following here. We need an HTTP server, web server, and an HTTP client web browser to use the HTTP protocol. The web server will serve a specific set of lines or files to the requesting uh, web browser. Three particular or popular choices for HTTP servers are Apache, Internet Information Services, IIS, which is uh, Microsoft stuff, and Nginx. Apache and Nginx are free and open source software. However, IIS is closed source and requires paying for a license. There are many web browsers available. At the time of writing, the most popular web browsers are Chrome by Google, Edge by Microsoft, Firefox by Mozilla, Safari by Apple. Web browsers are generally free to install and use. Furthermore, tech giants battle for a higher market share for their browsers. All right, question time. We've already launched it, so we're going to do this here and retrieve the flag.thm. So, and it should look something like this. See, we use telnet command to telnet into this particular system on port 80. And I basically did the same thing that we learned earlier, use this get, and then I want to get this particular file from that server. And then you gotta put HTTP forward slash 1.1 host telnet, yada, yada, yada. And we can see here that the flag was successfully retrieved from the system. So. Oops, I'm going to go ahead and copy this and paste it over like so. And let's continue on with task number four, file transfer protocol FTP. And let's see what they have for us. File transfer protocol FTP was developed to make the transfer of files between different computers with different systems efficient. FTP also sends and receives data as clear text. Therefore, we can use Telnet or Netcat to communicate with an FTP server and act as an FTP client. In the example below, we carried out the following steps. The first step, we connected to an FTP server using a Telnet client since FTP servers listen on port 21 by default. We had to specify to our Telnet client to attempt connection to port 21 instead of the default Telnet port. We needed to provide the username with the command user, Frank, and then the password is the following password here. Because we supplied the correct username and password, we got logged in. A command like stat uh, can provide some added information. The syst command shows the system type of the target, which is Unix in this case. Then pass v switches the mode to passive. It is worth noting that there are two modes for FTP active. 
In the active mode, the data is sent over a separate channel originating from the FTP servers, port 20. Passive. In the passive mode, the data is sent over a separate channel originating from an FTP client port above uh, port 1023. The command type A switches the file transfer mode to ASCII, while type I switches the file transfer mode to binary. However, we cannot transfer a file using a simple client such as Telnet because FTP creates a separate connection for the file transfer. And this is what it looks like here. You got Telnet to that particular machine and then port 21 trying to connect. And you can see here user Frank password login successful and they start typing out those commands that we discussed earlier to get some information and then quit to get out of it. The image below shows how an active file transfer would be conducted using FTP. To keep things simple in this figure, let's only focus on the fact that FTP client will initiate a connection to the FTP server, which listens on port 21 by default. All commands will be sent over the control channel. Once the clients request a file, another TCP connection will be established between them. The details of establishing the data connection slash channel is beyond the scope of this room. And here's what it looks like here. Considering the sophistication of the data transfer over FTP, let's use an actual FTP client to download a text file. We only need a small number of commands to retrieve the file. After logging and successfully, we get the FTP prompt, which looks like that. To execute various FTP, FTP commands, we can use the ls to list the files and learn the file name. And then we switch to ASCII since it is a text file, not binary. Finally, get file name. Made the client and server establish another channel for file transfer. And this is what it looks like here in the screenshot. FTP into that particular system, connected, and then username, password here. They did ls here. And there's the file, this readme.txt, and then ASCII, switching to ASCII mode. Then get the file so they can download it from that machine onto their own uh, machine here. And then... Let's see here, entering passive mode, et cetera, et cetera, transfer complete, exit, goodbye. All right, FTP servers and FTP clients use the FTP protocol. There are various FTP server software that you can select from if you want to host your FTP file server. Examples of FTP server software includes the following here, VSFTPD, ProFTPD, and UFTB. For FTP clients, in addition to the console FTP client commonly found on Linux systems. You can use an FTP client GUI such as FileZilla. Some web browsers also support FTP protocol. Because FTP sends the login credentials along with the commands and files in clear text, FTP traffic can be easily targeted for attackers. Now, instead of using FileZilla, which has like a lot of crap built into it now, like bundled um, adware and stuff, you can use something like WinSCP or something like that as an alternative. Using an FTP client, connect to the VM and try to recover the flag file. What is the flag? So let's go ahead and try this out. Hey everybody, just a quick little blurb here. As you can see here, most people that view my channel are not subscribers. If you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you're enjoying the video, please consider hitting the like button. It helps get me in the algorithm, helps spread the good word out there, helps bring more people and increase our glorious community here. All right, I'm all about helping out others. I know what it's like to come up in cybersecurity or even try to get into cybersecurity and not knowing where to look. I'm just having this channel up so I can help out other people. All right, that's all I got. Okay, let's go ahead and log into this machine via FTP like so, and our name's gonna be Frank. And the password's gonna be that one there. I've already have it copied, so I paste it in there, log in successful, and let's do an LS on it. And there is the flag. So let's go ahead and grab that flag. So it does not let me auto-complete. So let's go ahead and do it this way. THM, and there we go. I wonder if we can just cat it. Let's see. Let's see, maybe we can just cat it. Nope, oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and exit out of here. All right, so we have the file now on this attack box here, and now we can cat that flag like so, and get that particular uh, flag information we're looking for. So let's go ahead and copy this over and paste it. Now let's continue on to uh, task number five here, simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP. And let's see what they have for us.
Email is one of the most used services on the internet. There are various configurations for email servers. For instance, you may set up an email system to allow local users to exchange emails with each other with no access to the internet. However, we will consider the more general setup where different email servers connect over the internet. Every, or sorry, email delivery over the internet requires the following components. Number one, mail submission agent, which is MSA. Two, mail transfer agent, MTA. Mail delivery agent, MDA. And mail user agent, which is MUA. The above four terms may look cryptic, but they are most or more straightforward than they appear. We will explain these terms using the figure below. And this is what that figure looks like. So let's go ahead and dive into that particular um, steps here. The figure shows the following five steps that an email needs to go through to reach the recipient's inbox. Number one, a mail user agent, which is MUA, or simply an email client has an email message to be sent. The MUA con uh, connects to a mail submission uh, agent, MSA, to send its message. Number two, the MSA receives the message checks for any errors before transferring it to the mail transfer agent mta server commonly hosted on the same server number three the mta will send the email message to the mta of the recipient the mta can also function as a mail submission agent msa step four a typical setup would have the mta server also functioning as a mail delivery agent mda and then step number five, the recipient will collect its email from the MDA using their email client. If those steps sound confusing, consider the following analogy. Number one, you, the MUA, want to send postal mail. Number two, the post office employee MSA checks the postal mail for any issues before your local post office MTA accepts it. Number three, the local post office checks the mail destination and sends it to the post office MTA in the correct country. Four, the post office MTA delivers the mail to the recipient mailbox MDA. Five, the recipient MUA regularly checks the mailbox for a new mail. They notice the new mail and they take it. And the same way, we need to follow a protocol to communicate with an HTTP server, and we need to rely on email protocols to talk with MTA and MDA. These protocols are the following. The first one is Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, SMTP, Post Office Protocol version 3 is the second one, POP3, or Internet Message Access Protocol, IMAP. We explain SMTP in this task and elaborate on POP3 and IMAP in the following two tasks. So the first one here, we're going to talk about SMTP. It says it's used to communicate with an MTA server because SMTP uses clear text where all commands are sent without encryption. We can use a basic telnet client, connect to an SMTP server, and act as an email client, MUA, sending a message. SMTP server listens on port 25 by default to see basic communication with a SMTP server. We used Telnet to connect to it. Once connected, we issued this hello host name and then start typing our email. And here is what it looks like. They Telnet it into that machine, port 25, trying and says it's connected here and it's uh, connected correctly. It looks like hello Telnet, Telnet is the command here. And here's the rest of it here. As you can see, subject sending email with Telnet, hello Frank, I am writing to say hi, etc, etc. After hello, we issue mail from and then RCPT2 to indicate the sender and the recipient. When we send our email message, we issue the data uh, command and type our message. We issue this here, which is CR and LF or enter, enter. Put it in simpler terms, the SMTP server now queues the message. Generally speaking, we don't need to memorize SMTP commands. The console output above aims to help better explain what a typical mail client does when it uses SMTP. Okay, it wants us to connect to SMTP port of the target VM. What is the flag that you get? So let's go ahead and try this out. Okay, we have everything built out here, Telnet to this particular VM, and then port 25, hit enter, and there is our flag. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this over and we will continue on. 
Task number six, post office protocol three pop three. So let's see what they are talking about here. Post office protocol version three pop three is a protocol used to download the email messages from a mail delivery agent MDA server as shown in the figure below. The mail client connects to the pop three server, authenticates, downloads the new email messages before optionally deleting them. And that's what that looks like here. The example below shows what a POP3 session would look like if conducted with uh, a Telnet client. First, the user connects to the POP3 server and at the POP3 default port 110. Authentication is required to access the email messages. The user authenticates by providing the username, which is user frank, and password, which is pass, and then this password here. Using the command stat, we get the reply plus OK1179 based on RFC1939, a paused response to stat has the format plus OK and then NNMLMLM, where NN is the number of email messages in the inbox and LML is the size of the inbox in octets byte. The command list provided a list of new messages on the server and RETTR or RETR1 retrieved the first message in the list. We don't need to concern ourselves with memorizing these commands. However, it is useful to strengthen our understanding of such protocol. And that is what it looks like here. So I'm just going to copy and paste this over like so. So let's see if it lets me out of this real quick. Not recognized. Oh, OK, if I can spell. Nope. There we go, finally. So let's go ahead and paste this over. And all right, it says hello there. And let's go ahead and continue on here with user Frank password required. And the password's going to be this here. So I'm going to copy this and type it in. All right, logged in. So let's go ahead and type in list. All right, we got some kind of error here, but let's go ahead and continue on. The example above shows that the commands are Santa Clara text using Telnet was enough to authenticate and retrieve an email message as the username and password are sent in clear text. Any third party watching the network traffic can still the login credentials. In general, your mail client MUA will connect to the POP3 server MDA, authenticate and download the messages. Although the communication using the POP3 protocol will be hidden behind a sleek interface, similar commands will be issued as shown in the Telnet session above. Based on the default settings, the mail client deletes the, the mail message after it downloads it. The default behavior can be changed from the mail client settings if you wish to download the emails again from another mail client. Accessing the same mail account will or via multiple clients using POP3 is usually not very convenient as one will lose track of read and unread messages. To keep all mailboxes synchronized, you will uh, need to consider other protocols such as IMAP. All right, question time. Connect to the VM, which you've already done. Um, on pop three ports, authenticate using Frank and then that password. And then what is the response for stat? So let's go ahead and try stat while we're logged in here. And that's our response here. So go ahead and copy this over and paste it like so. How many messages um, are available to download from that particular machine here? And to check those messages okay so it looks like there aren't any so let's go ahead and continue on with task number seven internet message access uh, protocol imap and it says imap is more sophisticated than pop3 imap makes it possible to keep your email synchronized across multiple devices and mail clients in other words if you mark an email uh, message as read when checking your email on your smartphone the change will be saved on the IMAP server MDA and replicated on your laptop when you synchronize your mailbox. Let's take a look at sample IMAP commands and the console output below. We use Telnet to connect to IMAP 
service default port, and then we authenticate using the following here, login, all capitalized, and then user name and password. IMAP requires each command to be preceded by a random string to be able to track the reply. So we added C1 and then C2 and so on. Then we listed our mail folders using list and then double quote, double quote, double quote, star, double quote, before checking if we have any new messages in the inbox using examine inbox. We don't need to memorize these commands. However, we are simply providing the example below to give a vivid image of what happens when the mail client communicates with an IMAP server. So let's go ahead and exit out of this. Let's do a quit. There we go. So clear all this out and then we're gonna copy and paste this stuff over like so. So we can log in. All right. Let's see here. Now we're going to want to log in using this here. So I'm going to copy and just paste this stuff over like so. All right. Okay. Log in. Okay. And let's do this here. C2 star star or a star inside of these double quotes. Paste this over. Okay. There we go. And this is okay. List completed flags examine mailbox here. So let's go ahead and do that this way here. There we go. And let's take a look here. Okay, zero, zero. It, says, it is clear that IMAP sends the login credentials in clear text as we see in the command login. Frank, then the password. Anyone watching the network traffic would be able to know Frank's username and password. What is the default port used by IMAP? And that is going to be uh, port 143 for that. And that pretty much wraps up this video. So let's check out the summary and close it out. Task number eight, summary. This room covered various protocols, their usage, and how they work under the hood. Many other standard protocols are of interest to attackers. For instance, server message block SMB provides shared access to files and printers between networks, and it can be an exciting target. However, this room intends only to give a good knowledge of a few common protocols and how they work under the hood. One room or even a complete module can't cover all the network protocols. It is good to remember the default port number for common protocols. Below is a summary of the protocols we covered, sorted in alphabetical order along with their default port numbers. Okay, so take a look again at this particular table here. I'm not going to read through all of this here, but protocol, FTP, TCP port 21, applications, file transfer, data security, clear text. And the next one is HTTP port 80, World Wide Web, clear text. And you have the rest here, IMAP, POP3, SMTP, and then Telnet. In the next room is module, we will learn about various attacks against these protocols and servers, along with mitigation steps. By this you have completed the seventh room of the network security module. Please proceed to the protocols and servers two room to learn about related attacks and mitigation. So that's going to be probably our next video. So hit the complete here and we are done. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button with the notification bell, hit that like button as well. Also be sure to comment in the comment boxes below with your uh, thoughts, questions, whatever you have for me. As always, thank you all for taking the time to watch my video. Have a nice day, and I will see you later.